Hey, Wisecrack, Jared again. Like everyone else, sometimes I just need to laugh the pain away. Often the crushing anxiety of existence may feel like too much, but hey, that's why I have a dog. It helps. We at Wisecrack love us some Monty Python. These wily Brits redefined comedy in the 1970s and are still hugely influential. Just look at comedies today. South Park, Rick and Morty, or even Deadpool. All hilarious in their own unique ways, but without Monty Python, they probably wouldn't even exist. Monty Python paved the way for comedy as we know it, combining absurdity, satire, and postmodern reflexivity into some of the most influential and quoted comedies ever. This is an X. So, because there's nothing funnier than explaining a joke to death, welcome to this Wisecrack edition on the legacy of Monty Python. Oh, and we'll be answering your questions for the first hour in the comments, so see you there. Part 1. Postmodernism Like a hipster in a gluten-free juice bar, postmodernism is everywhere these days. Jurassic World, Star Wars, Family Guy, pretty much anything you can think of. These films and TV shows constantly refer back to themselves, commenting on the narrative conventions and iconography of their predecessors. It's another Death Star. I wish that were the case, Major. This was the Death Star. And this is Starkiller Base. Or, well, just copying them wholesale. But nothing encapsulates this movement more than Deadpool. Heck, we even did an entire philosophy of on this exact subject. Everyone loves Deadpool because, quite simply, he doesn't give a f He's rebelliously self-aware, repeatedly winking at his own narrative and mocking the superhero genre. Okay, let's pro-con this superhero thing. <sighs> this constant self-reflexivity encapsulates postmodernism, first coined by the French philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard in 1979. For Lyotard, all stories previously told fit into oft-told grand mythologies, great heroes on a voyage for some grandiose goal, or as he referred to them, meta-narratives. Per Leotard, these meta-narratives were stories that provided a pattern and structure for people's beliefs, teaching viewers a universal insight. Think of The Wizard of Oz and how when you strip it of all the flying monkeys and melting witches, it's actually just a story about a girl realizing that there's no place like home. Or even The Fast and the Furious. Underneath all the ludicrous car stunts, there's a deeper meta-narrative about the importance of family. Through these stories, morals and social customs are taught and reinforced, but postmodernism subverts these grand narratives, revealing the chaos and disorder beneath. Like, say, Deadpool, a comic book character who constantly tears down everything that comic books stand for. You're probably thinking, my boyfriend said this was a superhero movie, but that guy in the red suit just turned that other guy into a f kebab. But as edgy as Deadpool may seem, he ain't got sh on the Pythons, who took postmodern deconstruction to a whole other level. Case in point, their all-time classic, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Whereas Deadpool lampoons only the comic book meta-narrative, Monty Python and the Holy Grail is defined by breaking down multiple meta-narratives. Among them, Arthurian chivalry, Christianity, logic, and the very medium of film itself. The first of these meta-narratives, Arthurian chivalry, first evolved in the late Middle Ages, idealizing knights as honorable and self-sacrificing. You know, the usual knightly sh like protecting the weak, showing mercy to enemies, never lying, and championing truth and justice. But Monty Python and the Holy Grail completely dismantles and mocks these time-tested tenets. Who's that then? I don't know. Must be a king. Go on. He hasn't got shit all over him. When Sir Robin encounters a three-headed giant, his minstrels sing the heroic narrative that everyone expects. Bravely bold Sir Robin brought forth from Camelot. He was not afraid to die. Oh, brave Sir Robin. But Robin himself runs the hell away as quickly as possible. Brave Sir Robin ran away. No! Bravely ran away, away. I didn't! Similarly, in the Arthurian legend, Arthur's arrival at Camelot is usually treated as an emotional high point in his story. Camelot. 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 Yet, Monty Python undercuts the seriousness of the moment, turning this hallmark event into a goofy musical number. When lights are on the table, we dance where we're able. We do routines to call the scenes to put work in bed. And then to top it off, Arthur decides not to even bother going to Camelot. No, on second thoughts, let's not go to Camelot. It is a silly place. Each of our supposed great heroes are revealed to be far less than they claim. The power-hungry Arthur demands that every peasant acknowledge him as their king. Oh, I think he is. 
I'm your king. Well, I didn't vote for you. But if they dare question his rule, he immediately attacks them. Come and see the violence inherent in the system. Help, help, I'm being repressed, bloody peasant. Oh, what a giveaway. Did you hear that? Did you hear that, eh? That's what I'm on about. Sir Galahad the Pure, the most faithful of knights, is seduced in less than four minutes by a company of 160 lonely women. And when Lancelot receives a note from a distressed maiden, he rushes to rescue her, but in the process, murders dozens of unarmed people. Then in the end, it turns out, there wasn't even a maiden to save in the first place. Thing is, I thought your son was a lady. I can understand that. Monty Python uses postmodernism to illustrate how the stories people tell themselves enable some awful sh**. Lancelot and Arthur's own meta-narratives justifying their violent and oppressive acts. The fact that these meta-narratives aren't even true to begin with is just the icing on the cake, as our knightly heroes are revealed to be cowards, hypocrites, and violent sociopaths. You see what I mean? I just get carried away. I'm really most awfully sorry. Sorry! Sorry, everyone! Even God is put into doubt. Per the Christianity meta-narrative, God is good and all-powerful and has a plan for humanity. Yet, in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, God isn't great and kind at all. He's just a cranky dick who's really crappily animated. Philosopher Mikhail Bakhtin defined this as the downward swing, which I swear isn't a baseball term. Per Bakhtin, most stories are upward swings in that they elevate a story to a symbolic state and make them universal. On the contrary, in a downward swing, the classical story becomes so distorted and grotesque that you don't even know whether to scream, cry, or laugh. And it's not just the story that becomes distorted, but also we, the readers and viewers ourselves. Every lesson we learned through the meta narrative is now cast into doubt right alongside it. Take one of the most famous scenes in the Holy Grail, the witch trial. Sir Bedivere the Wise puts a poor woman through a foolproof logic test in order to determine if she's a witch. Per Bedivere, witches burn at the stake just like wood, and wood floats on water just like a duck. So if the woman is a witch, she will weigh the same as a duck. Monty Python here takes formal logic and distorts it into a grotesque version of itself, in effect casting doubt on our own fundamental faith in logic. If classical logic can be distorted into justifying a woman's death, then how can it be truly trusted at all? By the end of the Holy Grail, this distortion extends to the very film itself. As Arthur prepares for an epic battle with the French at Castle Arg, modern-day police suddenly arrive and arrest the king for murder. The police then push and cover the camera lens, breaking the fourth wall, making the audience cognizant of the fact they're watching a movie. The Holy Grail constantly pokes fun at itself for being a movie. For instance, the film's title credits are undermined when Swedish subtitles suddenly appear, promoting the country as a terrific vacation spot. The credit makers are then promptly fired, causing the credit format to completely change. Throughout the film, Arthur uses coconuts instead of a horse due to the film's tight budget. And later, Arthur even refers to one character as There's the old man from scene 24. And just to hammer the point home, the knights defeat the legendary Black Beast of Arg, not through any battle or test of wills, but because the animator that designed the creature has a heart attack. This self-reflexivity reveals the Holy Grail to be its own meta-narrative, film just as artificial as the chivalrous Arthurian heroes within. Do you think this scene should have been cut? We were so worried when the boys were writing it, but now we're glad. It's better than some of the previous scenes, I think. That's just how postmodern Monty Python and the Holy Grail truly is. It deconstructs religion and logic within a deconstruction of heroic tropes within a deconstruction of the film medium itself. Basically, the inception of postmodern film. Part 2. The Comedy of the Absurd There's probably no show as popular on the interwebs as Rick and Morty. I mean, be honest, Wisecrack's really just a domain switch away from becoming a Rick and Morty fan club. And that's because the show always ties its absurd humor with thought-provoking insight, like, well, on the meaninglessness of life. Yes! You got Not today, bitch! Take the Get Schwifty episode. When massive heads suddenly appear all across the planet, many people begin to worship the heads as gods, starting up a cult and even sacrificing people to appease them. Of course, in reality, these heads aren't gods at all but an alien race that just wants Earth to participate in an American Idol-like reality show. This type of humor is known as the comedy of the absurd. This existential-based comedy focuses on the fallout when confronted with a world devoid of meaning. However, instead of wallowing in some murky, woe-is-me despair, the absurd takes the opposite approach, pointing out the broad humor in our own tragic insignificance. This tragic absurdity is foundational to Monty Python's brand of humor. In their third feature, The Life of Brian, poor Brian's entire existence is one big absurd misunderstanding. 
the humble peasant is born in the stable next to Jesus, confusing the three wise men, who assume the not-special-at-all Brian to be the Messiah. He is the Son of God, our Messiah, King of the Jews. That's Capricorn, is it? The projection of significance on the insignificant is a hallmark of existential thought, in particular our boy Albert Camus, who rejected this desperate search for meaning and instead embraced the, you guessed it, absurd. When Brian runs away from his disciples, they mistakenly believe he's risen to heaven. And later, when Brian loses a sandal, these same disciples proclaim the sandal his sign. Of course, Brian didn't mean for the sandal to be anything more than footwear, and yet people, in their desire for meaning, attribute significance to even the silliest of objects. It is his gourd. We will carry it for you, master. We see this exact same misappropriation of meaning in Get Swifty, as Principal Vagina and the rest of his cult mistake the alien heads as gods, when actually they're only reality TV show junkies. Comedies of the absurd draw their humor from this discrepancy, between what is and what isn't, between what's true and what people believe to be true. Characters in these absurd comedies are often caught in hopeless situations, forced into repetitive and ultimately fruitless actions, like Brian, who constantly tries to tell his disciples he's not the Messiah, but too little avail. Only the true Messiah denies his divinity! No matter what Brian does, his disciples grow in number and become ever more fervent, all leading to a horrific and tragic conclusion. Crucifixion. Yet, despite his impending doom, Brian's comforted by his fellow crucifixion buddies, who break out into song. Always look on the bright side of life. Come on! The crucifixion buddies' cheerful lament reflects the myth of Sisyphus, in which poor Sisyphus is cursed to roll a rock up a mountain, only for it to fall back down over and over again. Camus famously applied the Greek myth to life itself. The trick, though, is not to let this meaninglessness ever get you down. Instead, in the words of Life of Brian, always look at the bright side. Because when faced with our own insignificance and impending doom, there's only one real option. Though it may seem completely f***ing absurd, laughter. Part 3. Political Satire Nowadays, satire has become more vital than ever. Whether via late-night talk shows like Full Frontal with Samantha Bee, or more traditional half-hour comedies like South Park. Hell, the last three seasons of South Park focused heavily on the 2016 election and the Trump presidency. I don't give two shits about a treaty. You're a Polish midget. Political satires like South Park derive their humor by revealing the hypocrisy in established rules and orders, a la the 2016 election and the PC Brigade. But way before South Park, Monty Python paved the way, subverting the established political ideologies of England. In fact, South Park creators Trey Parker and Matt Stone often cite Monty Python as the single biggest influence on their show. Matt and I met and got along so well because we were just pure Python freaks. Mm -hmm. In Monty Python's final and darkest feature, The Meaning of Life, the Pythons openly comment on English imperialism, economic disparity, and the classist social hierarchies of the country. The opening mini-movie, The Crimson Permanent Assurance, depicts a group of poor elderly workers forced into a pirate-like frenzy by young American American yuppies. The old workers rebel against these yuppie dicks, throwing them out windows to their death, and then proceed to destroy every shiny bright corporate building in their path, bringing down the system that literally anchored them to the ground. The Pythons carry this satirical look at capitalism throughout the film, questioning the economic notion that self-interest results in the greater good. In fact, we see quite the opposite. In the sketch The Miracle of Birth, the doctors are far more concerned with their fancy equipment and impressing their administrator than the poor woman they're operating on. And get the most expensive machines in case the administrator comes. Later, in the sketch Live Organ Transplants, two bureaucrats forcefully remove the liver from an impoverished man for the good of the country, remarking nonsensically that they must kill the guy so that they can then take his liver. What do you want? What do you do with them all anyway? They all go to saving lives, madam. Constantly, we see people drowning under this system. Britain's Yorkshire is ironically referred to as a third world country. And in the same sketch, a poor man is forced to sell off his children to science in order to make ends meet. This economic disparity climaxes in the sketch The Autumn Years, where the grotesquely obese and rich Mr. Creosote dines at a fancy restaurant, eating more and more until he literally explodes. <laughs> The implications couldn't be clear. The rich get richer and fatter at the expense of the starving lower class. But it's not just social injustice that the Python skewer, but the whole notion of British imperialism in general. 
the hand of God strikes down a military officer who insists Britain will always need an army to put down differing ideologies. And in the same sketch, a sergeant major drills his platoon on whether they have anything better to do than march up and down the town square. Well, it turns out they do. Well, to be quite honest, Sarge, I'd rather be at home with the wife and kids. Would you now? Yes, Sarge. Right, off you go! Like read a book, or go to the movies, or really, anything at all. The Pythons even state this central thesis at the end of the picture. I try and be nice to people, avoid eating fat, read a good book every now and then, get some walking in, and try and live together in peace and harmony with people of all creeds and nations. For the Pythons, British imperialism is a threat to the meaning of life. This manifests in their depiction of war, where soldiers attempting to celebrate a birthday are gunned down one by one. The brutal reality of war, of supposed imperial conquest, juxtaposed against the simple pleasure of enjoying a birthday cake. These ideas extend to their sketch show The Flying Circus. The show often portrays bureaucrats as buffoons, or as sticks in the mud, constantly censoring the show itself. I'm not prepared to pursue my line of inquiry any further, as I think this is getting too silly. Quite agree, quite agree. Silly, silly, silly. Right. Get on with it. Get on with it! As Christopher Hitchens once said, the essential founding gag of Monty Python is the bubbling magma of absurdity that lay beneath the fragile crust of British reserve. At any moment, a man with a bowler hat or an umbrella might become a raging crossdresser or barking sadist. It's this unpredictability, this mixture between the postmodern, the political, and the absurd that makes Monty Python unlike any comedy troupe that came before or after. By merging together social commentary, existential angst, and just plain old silliness, the Pythons always keep you on your toes. They defied convention, concocting a brand of comedy so singular that a word has been created just for them. Python-esque. Today, their brand of humor permeates every facet of the comedic landscape. As always, thanks for watching, guys. Peace.